The sinking of the British passenger steamer RMS Laconia has haunted me since I first heard about it. It's one of the most famous stories of the Second World War. I've learned about dramatic new evidence that suggests there's far more to this story than first meets the eye. On September the 12th, 1942, the RMS Laconia was sailing in the mid-Atlantic, bound for England. She was carrying civilians and soldiers returning home and hundreds of Italian prisoners of war bound for internment camps in the UK. Several days from safety and hundreds of miles from land, she was attacked by a German U-boat. Two torpedoes struck her starboard side in quick succession. The Laconia started to take in water fast. Accounts talk of stunned passengers and crew scrambling to escape. attempted to board the already overloaded lifeboats that were fought off by the American soldiers. The scene turned into a bloodbath. At first glance, this is an open and shut case. For decades it has been assumed that most of the passengers and POWs drowned, and those who didn't were taken by sharks. But I've always wondered whether that was the whole story. My previous investigations have often shown that the answer is seldom what is first assumed. And now I have a chance to find the true culprits. Because buried deep inside this archive, I've discovered a forgotten cache of eyewitness accounts, full of clues that could turn this story on its head. Many hundreds of people ended up in the water where some mysteriously just disappeared. Dragged beneath the surface with only their life jackets ever re-emerging. Bodies found by rescuers days later had been attacked by creatures in the water. And of those, a number showed bite marks that still don't point to any obvious perpetrator. New evidence suggests multiple mystery attackers, but what were they? With over a thousand victims, this will be a huge and complex case. But using the accounts of those who lived through it, I'm going to find out what happened to those who didn't. The people who wrote those eyewitness accounts are long gone. But there is one survivor who I have managed to find. I'm on my way to meet a woman who was actually on the Laconia that night. Um, she is one of only a handful of survivors who are still alive today. At the time, she was just a 14-year-old girl and she was fleeing the war in Singapore and she was traveling with her mother, her father and her brother. What happened when suddenly it was no longer normality on the boat well, at that point? It was eight o'clock and the first torpedo struck. It was awful. But by the time you gathered your senses, the second one hit. Josephine and her family only had a minutes to get up on deck. My father threw the life jackets at us and he said, come on, the lifeboat stations. We dropped everything rushed out of the cabin. The screaming, the screams were just terrible. It was total, total chaos. They lowered our lifeboat to the sea, and the minute it hit the water, people were trying to climb into it as well. They were having to be pushed away. We couldn't take any more. 
I witnessed an Italian prisoner of war being shot by a man in our lifeboat. He was trying to go on and... Oh, he was shot. That was war. War at its worst. So the men rowed, and they rowed, and they rowed. And we managed to get quite away from the ship. And when we looked, the stern came up, and then it went down, and then everywhere was pitch black. I received permission to travel to a military base, a tiny speck of land just 250 miles from where the Laconia went down, known as Ascension Island. Ascension is one of the most remote islands anywhere on Earth. It's right slap bang in the middle of the Atlantic, sort of halfway between Africa and South America. But most importantly for me, it's the closest I can get to the scene of the incident. Ascension is a British and US military base, and travel to the island is heavily controlled. Evening. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ascension flight, yeah. Gaining access to Ascension is one thing, but now my whole investigation hinges on what fish I find when I get there. And some areas of the island are strictly off limits. But it's the vast expanse of water around this speck of land that interests me. Very few people get to fish here, either recreationally or commercially, which means that the species that are here now are going to be the same ones that were here in 1942. I now want to see what's in the water around the island. I'm heading to a remote spot which isn't often fished. Beneath the surface here, the land shelves off very quickly. So even with the cast from the shore, I should be on the edge of deep water. It's lovely looking clear water. Um, there are a few beaches here and there on the island, but mostly it's rock and fairly treacherous underfoot. But I just thought while I was trying to get a boat sorted out, I'd come along and get some lures in the water, see you know, start to get a feel for what's living around here. The thing that's quickly becoming apparent to me is how rich these waters are. Also, how competitive the fish are. You get one fish on the end of the line or one fish showing interest and it, it sort of calls in the other fish. And I think in terms of my investigation, I think this could be pretty significant. The seas here are teeming. There's little doubt about that, even from just a few hours fishing. But I don't think that the fish that hit my lures today would have been present or of any significance that night when the Laconia sank. But they do give me a vital behavioral clue. Undoubtedly, the Laconia sinking was an event in the ocean, not just for the people involved, but also for the animals that live there. There would have been no shortage of distress signals in the water that night, with over a thousand people floundering at the surface. The question is, would those signals have been enough to start a feeding frenzy in the open ocean?